Okay, we are now recording. Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to this May 8th meeting of the uh, Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee. And this is a reminder that ECAC, Energy and Climate Action Committee, was organized to guide the town in meeting its climate mitigation and resilience goals. Those goals and the plans for getting for meeting them are adopted from the Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan, or the CARP, which was accepted by the Town Council back in 2021. Uh, with 2016 as its base year, the CARP called for a or calls for a 25% reduction in carbon emission by 2025, 50% by 2030, and carbon neutrality by 2050. So this committee has two primary functions, one to advise the town council and recommend or propose policies or actions that will help us meet our climate goals, and two, to promote a just, equitable, and speedy climate response through outreach and engagement of town and local stakeholders. And with that, we will get to today's agenda, um, the first part of which is to, let's get a note taker and then review the minutes. So um, uh, Steve, are you volunteering? I think my name is next on the list, so I'm Excellent. taking notes. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, in that case, I can share the minutes from last time and we'll quickly go through them. Share screen. Okay, minutes, share. Okay, I think I have the right minutes here. I just have to put you guys back where I can see you. Zoom thinks I know where I want your faces to be on my screen, so it moves you. <laughs> All right, so um, there we go. These are our minutes from last time. I just I didn't see anything that needed fixing in them, but if anyone sees something or knows something, say something. Otherwise, I will move through relatively quickly. Sustainability Festival, lots of good updates last week, two weeks ago. Is there a move to accept the minutes? I groove to accept the minutes. Thank you, Jesse. Second. I second. Oh. Tony, was that you? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, and in no particular order, Goldner? Yes. McElrath? Yes. Allison? Yes. Roof? Yes. Ising? Yes. Breger? Yes. I'll wait until Jesse. Yes, Jesse? sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Something happened. No worries. Minutes are approved. Okay, and it looks like we might have some participants, attendees, Martha. Uh, so next on the agenda is um, public comments. Any, any insight for us today, Martha? Ah, there we go. So Martha has her hand up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Martha. You can unmute. Hey, thank you. Hello, it's Martha Hanner from District 5. And uh, so I think the main thing I wanted to ask is whether, Dwayne, in your, when you get to your presentation, whether are you going to talk about the solar forum that's coming up and does it have a date and a program or anything yet? I'd be interested in hearing that when the time comes. Uh, it has a date, <laughs> but uh, it has a date. So well, that's a start. Yes. Yeah, uh, so I can tell you what I know when the time comes. Yep. Yeah, I guess when, when yeah. there's a yeah. And there, the, we haven't gotten the announcement out yet. We're just planning to do that this week. Okay. And the only other thing I'd say is, Laurie, that picture of you 
giving your heat pump advice for five cents is excellent. And I hope that you are saving it to use for publicity whenever it becomes appropriate when we were trying to, you know, pub popularize heat pumps. That's I will, I will do yeah. that. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's it. Mm. All right. Um, so shall we move on to our agenda, the rest of our agenda? Uh, we got education and outreach, the first part of our mission first. And Don, I think you're up. I, I am. Yep. I am. So um, I finally actually spent a couple of hours going through um, Mass Development's website. Um, and then another 45 minutes listening to a webinar that they have on their site. Um, it's a November 8th, 2023 webinar. Um, it's led by Wendy O'Malley, who's the senior vice president there for green finance. And it was a combination webinar. It's actually really worth listening to. It's a combination webinar where the first part is Wendy with her slideshow about PACE and PACE financing. And the second half of it is another individual who deals with um, the stretch codes, R codes, the base code, stretch code, and specialized stretch code, and the interface between those, that code, specialized particularly, and PACE and the various requirements of PACE. Um, you know, th this is all about, the, you know, the addition of new construction as being available for PACE, PACE financing. Um, it, it's... The, the the regs are there the new guidelines are there um they are the 2.0 guidelines if people want to look them up um and, but i do encourage listening to the webinar because it it will give everybody a, a real understanding of pace and how pace can fit into um new construction as well as retrofits and existing construction. Again, it does only apply to um, commercial and multifamily units, um, meaning five family residential units. Uh, but it's, it's, it's well worth it. Um, mm -hmm. And I have a much better understanding of it. Um, and again, um, Maybe I, I, go ahead. I will work with Stephanie to try to set up some sort of um, some sort of an event, or if people have ideas about how to promote it. I still don't think, even looking at this relatively recent webinar, that there have been that many pace projects in Massachusetts, um, despite the fact that it's been around for a while. So. Laura, you were going to say? I was just going to say, maybe you can send the link to that webinar. Sure. Um, I don't know how to send links. I'm 72 and I'm a, but I can tell you um, that it's uh, uh, the, the best way to get to it is to go to um, massdevelopment.com. And then it basically says, you know, who we are and what we do. And then there's, uh, which are in boxes at the top and you should basically click on what we offer. I'm sorry, what we offer. And about halfway down the what we offer page is a very clearly marked 11-8-23 webinar. It's about halfway down the page and it's 45 minutes long. I can and send that out to everybody. Yeah. I'll get it out to everybody. Okay, I'm not seeing it, but okay, if you'll get that out, that's great. I'll so get it. I have a couple other- you know, where, you know where it is, right, Stephanie? You, yeah. I'll, yeah, yeah, I can get it. Okay, good. I'm also, I also signed up to get updates from them. They, they, when you listen to it and you, they're very, very open to calling in with any problems, any information, very, very educationally oriented. Um, this, this, uh, Wendy, particularly in her office. On, on green finance. And I'm sorry, I forget the name of the uh, person who gave the half of the thing on, on the, on the building code and it's, it's interface. 
All right, good. So then the next question is, how do we get this information out to the local business community? Of all the building, I mean, there's an awful lot of building going on in Amherst these days. Um, and big buildings too, right? Going up all over the place. We keep building more apartments. <laughs> Isn't there a new project that just got okay somewhere? I was seeing an announcement about. At any rate, it seems to me like we have. Yeah, B Barry Roberts is knocking, not just knocked down the building out my window. Um, yeah. <laughs> right in the center of town to connect to the um uh, the old hastings building yeah right right yeah it, it I, I would be curious if um if what version of the uh energy code they intend to meet for that building well don't um, oh is our stretch code not in effect yet our july, I'm sorry, july. Our, in july our specialized code is our specialized stretch code in effect july no the specialized yeah. isn't, but the, but it's still the the stretch code is. Yeah. For a reno, it'd be curious to see for a renovation, if they're gonna. This isn't a rent. This isn't a renovation. He he knocked he knocked down the buildings and. Oh yeah, no, I, For the is, the renovation portion. Oh. The front building wow. is being renovated, which should also meet the energy. Code. Yeah. Stephanie's had her hand up for a couple minutes. Uh, Sorry, I just wanted to follow up with. Don and sort of next steps in terms of mass development. It seems like we can um, reach out to them now and speak to them about either trying to revisit doing an event, or at the very least, it might be make might make more sense to try to do this as one of our educational series events, mm -hmm. but have, actually have someone from mass development do the presentation this time, and then it'll be recorded. So what we could do is send the link out to the chamber and the bid so that they could maybe share the link with the recorded presentation to sort of help get the word out. Just I'm thinking of some very quick, easy, easier ways for us to sort of get the word out. Um, that would be faster than even planning something like an event with the chamber. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Do you know, so is Wendy the person to contact and who's going to take yeah, I I mean, um, I, I can work with you, Stephanie, and, yeah. and call. We can contact somebody. I, I would contact Wendy. I, I I truly like the presentation combining both the building code and pace to get to get a much better understanding of you know how how they work together. So, yeah, a recap of that that's specific for folks here. Um, I think the needs here are probably a little different than what you might find closer to Boston. Might be interesting. Okay, good. So let's let's get yeah. that on the agenda for next time then and set a date and you know find a time to do that. I think that'd be great. Anything else on that? Nope. Cool. All right. Um, so Tony. Um, you were going to send out a list of local groups. I'm not sure I ever saw. Oh it. yeah, no, I did not get to that again. I was very ill for a very long time. Oh, I'm so um, sorry. But uh, if you can remind me who I send that to, would that just be Stephanie or you, Lori? Either one of us, and we can send it to everyone. Stephanie's. Oh always. yeah, <laughs> I can do that. Sorry. If you about send that. it to me, I make sure it gets in the packet. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. No worries. No worries. Is there any other, um, anything new on that front that we should know about or mm -hmm. between being sick and, and what's going on on campus? I can imagine you had your hands full. Yeah, but okay. I will uh, do some updates. Yeah. All right, heat pumps, let's see. I did have something I was going to mention there. Oh yes, LEA. So, um, Going on to heat pumps, I want to make sure I get this right. Give me just a moment. Okay, so there is a group. Um, they are not LEA, but they spun out of that, uh, consisting of Eric Broadbent and Tom Bassett and uh, Denise Lello, a bunch of people who are interested in putting together a heat pump uh, coaching program for the Valley, for Northampton. They're all in Northampton, but no reason why we couldn't tack onto that as well. They're just starting, they just started this week to have a little meeting to talk about how to organize it. I'm gonna keep my 
fingers on the pulse of that. I'm on their mailing list, but I told them I don't have time to help organize. I'm happy to be a heat pump coach, but there's only so much I can do and organizing that, that effort is not something I have time to do. So um, I'm just gonna keep an eye on it because I think uh, we may possibly have a heat pump coaching organized program in the area before we have a heat pump program in um, Amherst. So um, either way, I think it's great. <laughs> that they're working on this. Um, so I just wanted to let folks know about that. Otherwise, Stephanie, why don't you tell us about where the RFP is now? Sure, so exciting news is that the RFP finally actually got released. Um, I made some edits, Lori uh, reviewed what I had done and then we got it back to procurement. Um, it was actually released, I think on the 6th, so two days ago. So it'll be advertised for a couple of weeks at least, and then hopefully we will get some bids. I did send the notice of it being released to at least, I think four, maybe five um, consultants and businesses that I thought would, you know, with Lori's guidance too, uh, would be likely to maybe take a look and potentially submit a proposal. So um, so it's out there and it's in several places. It's on combines. So it's that's the state um, sort of procurement list of projects. And so that's, you know, that'll go out pretty far beyond our little, you know, Western mass reach. So, um, so we'll see, you know, um, my fingers crossed that we get some decent proposals in. Yeah. For, for the record, Stephanie, can you just briefly describe what the RFP is seeking? Yeah, so it's to secure, um, well, I guess it's to in secure an installer. But we have sort of two parts that we're looking for. We're looking for someone who can actually install the heat pumps, but run the program because it's an incentive program. So we would want them to be able to provide information to the community members. Um, They'd have to be knowledgeable in installation. Uh, they would also be the ones that would sort of work with a customer to um, purchase the heat pump and then sort of work with us on the reimbursement for the purchase. Um, the education piece, we did take out things like having them oversee a, um, like a organizing the coaching program we kind of took that out. We did have it in the beginning and then we took it out because the more I talked to procurement, they just really felt like it was just kind of an overreach. Um, so there is an option for like a um, mass save agency to work with a particular installer and to subcontract with an installer. Um, so it's kind of more advantageous or most advantageous if we get an installer who can actually do the program as well. And I do think that there are a few um, companies, like I think Northeast Solar is doing heat pump installations now, and they may have the capacity to do more of um, some of the community outreach as well. Yeah. Um, so I think there, you know, I, yeah, I think there were, there were, Three different levels, I think, of, of yep. what would be acceptable. And the highest one was an installer who can do all the outreach and everything as well. Yeah. The second one was someone who could do the outreach and partner with an installer. Yeah. And then the third, but the third one is like all you, I mean, it's, we're really, you, there's really the first two options. Yeah. We can't really get someone who doesn't have an installer involved in this. We have to have an installer mm -hmm. involved. So really we're looking for a contractor who can do kind of both or work with, and it's to work with us. It's not that they have to do it all. I mean, it's very much written as a collaboration between the consultant and the town right. or the contractor, I'm sorry, in the town. And are there other towns, you know, I should have asked about this. Um, are there other towns that are doing something like this, Stephanie, that was that you used as a template or is it no, not, I mean, not exactly with what we wanted. I mean, we wanted something very specific. So I had to go with what we were, yeah, I was being asked for. So um, right. I, there are other communities like Northampton had a heat pump program a while ago. Um, I think Greenfield has done something somewhat similar, but they're not 
exact. Okay. So. Well, hopefully we'll get a few more heat pumps in. Um, I think people, you know, people are, I think the advantage of the timing is that there's, A, there's just way more incentives now for, you know, at the federal state level. Um, so this is just like a local incentive on top of those. So I think the timing is good for somebody who is looking to install a heat pump. Um, and I think that more people now are understanding what they are more than they have certainly even five years ago. I think five years ago, people had no clue. And that's, you know, as much as some of those communities like Northampton or Greenfield are more cutting edge that they started earlier, I think there was less consumer awareness so we might benefit from having a little more time and a little more opportunity for people to learn and be educated more about what they are. Right, right. Is this primarily for uh, residents, residential, plate, or does it include commercial or public town buildings? This is buildings? not town buildings. This is primarily okay. a residential program and it's really targeted for low income. Is I mean, it's anybody, but I think we're specifically wanting to do the outreach for the low income residences and apartment buildings, you know, um, you know, for um, multi family housing units, like maybe three, three family housing units or more. Yeah. And what's the time frame? Are you hoping to, uh, do you have a deadline for the yeah, RFP? It, absolutely. Yeah. Because this is, well, the, the deadline you mean for the application, the proposals to come in? Yes. That's probably like a few weeks. Okay. I don't, I don't, I didn't actually see when it got um, posted. I can't remember what she had for the, usually, usually we have them out for a couple of weeks and then that gives us a little time to review and do interviews. Um, we're hoping to launch the program. Let's see if this is May, you know, by the end of June, beginning of July is the hope to get the program launched sometime around then. Um the program will run for two years though. So the program will go through till the end of 2026. But because this is ARPA funded, the all of the money has to be expended before December of 2026. So our target in the RFP is to have everything completed by November of 2026, mm -hmm. just to make sure if there's any outstanding invoices, they all get processed before. All right. Any other? So I don't have anything else on <clears throat> heat pumps unless there's any more discussion. Um, I guess uh, climate resilient schools. Oh, go ahead, Jesse. Did you have something? Or were you reaching up? No, I'm sorry. I was just saying goodbye to someone who was leaving. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thought your hand was up. <laughs> All right. So. Um, the next thing on the agenda is this climate resilient schools effort, which has sort of gotten awfully quiet. I've been on their Slack channel and I don't see a lot going on there. So I don't really have anything to report. I'll just keep my finger on that pulse again too. And you know, if something interesting happens where we can participate, I'll let folks know. Um, I didn't hear how walk, bike or roll to school went. That was this week, wasn't it? How'd that go? I we I sort of lost last year. We we did a little publicity around that. This year we sort of what, what was in October. It was a different time of year. Maybe they do it more than once a year. Um, anyone hear anything about that? So there were about about a dozen kids left from the South Amherst Common to ride over to Crocker Farm School, oh, which was very nice. It was a, a smallish group, but. Still, it was nice to see a bunch of kids and adults riding along the road there. All right, so moving on from there um, to our advisory and support role. First thing on the agenda is um, the rental building, um, rental slash building efficiency, rental bylaw building efficiency component. <laughs> uh, Steve, you want to? Give us an update. Nothing new to update there since I last spoke. I think we still have some concepts, but um, nothing new to work on those. Okay, and next on the list is the solar so bylaw. Laurie, I have, have a comment? Oh, yeah, I, I do actually. Sorry. Um, 
I did reach out to Rob Mora after I sent him the question, Steve, that you had identified. Oh, good. And okay. we had talked about um, the fact that you might narrow that even further. Um, but he said it's not going to be possible to actually put it, those questions in the bylaw, but certainly when the inspectors are at the point where they're doing their inspections, it may be if you can really, if it can get narrowed down even more so, um, because they, I, I'm sorry, I had notes about our conversation and I don't have them in front of me, but they have a ridiculously long list of questions that the inspectors have to actually ask when they, and this is a whole new inspections arm that's being created for this particular effort. So the list of questions that they have is already really lengthy. Um, so I think the the question was like, can you really narrow it down to exactly what is the information that's most needed? And if it can really get honed in um, a little more, that would be helpful. And they might be able to do that when they do the, when the inspectors do their actual inspections. Hmm. Okay. My understanding was this was not questions going to the bylaw, but to go into the regulations. And my thought was that these would be questions that could be on the online rental permit application, not additional things that the inspectors would look for when they were doing their inspections. So it would be owner or owner representative reported information on the online application. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I can sort of clarify that, but I think again, he. Um... I don't know that they'd actually make them on the application, but I can talk to him a little more. Okay. And, and do you have a sense how much shorter or fewer? Should we like cut the list in half or? A... It, honestly, like I said, I would just get it down to like, what is the, if you could get it down to literally like two or three essential things that are the most important things that information would be useful to have that would be that would be best and i and i'm sorry i may find i'll look for my notes because i did have some notes about my conversation from my conversation with him so i'm i apologize that i don't have them right in front of me but um there was more that he said and i'm sorry i just don't remember off the top of my head all right well, i guess if you could send that to me that will help me figure out how to shorten that list and and tune it for what what they can hopefully do for us yeah his guidance was not I mean, I don't have more that he said that would help you. Oh, okay. I, I, that piece, it was just more like get it down to as few as you can, <laughs> I think is the basic guidance. And my my addition was what is the information that is the most pertinent in order to get what information we feel like we need. Let me let's see if I have that you list. Have the list. If you have the list, maybe we can spend a few minutes <clears throat> talking about that. Yeah, let me do, do, do. I bet it's there. Yes. So the things I have on that list do, 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 do um looks like what two, four, six, eight, nine, nine questions. You the first share? one is what what fuels are used for space seating? I could should I share my screen? Would that be helpful to see this list? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. Okay, hang on. Just let me find my, where we are. Participants, share screen and screen one and share. And are you seeing that? I think you're seeing it now. So there's just, a, I wrote just a little preamble that's at the top there, but down here, these bullets represent those questions. So what fuels are being used? And that could be a checklist, electricity, fuel, oil, methane, gas, propane. What is the space heating system? Another checklist, electric baseboard, hot water baseboard, or radiators, steam, steam radiators, forced hot air, ground source heat pumps, air source heat pump, or slash mini splits. Uh, how old is the heating system? What fuels are used for domestic hot water? That would be another checklist. Um, that's, that's distinct from the space heating. Um, how old is the domestic heating water heating system, the domestic hot water heating system, how old is it? Do the rental units have air conditioning? If so, what types? That would be a, a checklist or drop list of uh, window shakers, mini splits, or central. 
and then do tenants pay their own energy bills? What is the annual cost for electricity and heating slash cooling per rental unit? And has the rental property had a mass save energy assessment recently? If so, when? Yeah. So, so you helped a lot making this list uh, a, a year or two ago. So if, um, if you have some suggestions, I'd love to hear them. Um, that was for Jesse. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <clears throat> is it cheating to just simply say, you know, what is the fuel age and type of heating, cooling and hot water systems? <laughs> uh honestly like is that is this cute because if we're getting it down to two it, something like that what is the fuel age and type of the space and water heating systems or, or even the the heating cooling and hot water systems <laughs> of just the of type of the heating, cooling, and hot water systems. Uh, and then mm. that might be too much. Again, I, I'd imagine this would be on that online permit application where there are, a, at least the current version, has quite a few questions that pose to the property owner. And that includes like the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, that, that sort of thing. So I thought these sort of questions were in line with that. And providing some of them as drop down or checklists would make it quick and convenient for people filling out the online application to do so. Um, so that's a, that's a little, it'd be a little bit different if we we're asking the inspectors to be noting this, the town employed inspectors to be noting this as they inspect systems. Plus they're only going to be inspecting a fraction of the units each year. So we would gather the information more slowly if it was done by the inspectors. I mean, if it's a checklist, it seems, you know, boom, 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 shouldn't. Any building inspector could would not take much to. That's right. So to, I was like a little grid with boxes. It's you're making you're checking four boxes. It's should, that seems easy. I think the the mass save question is a good one because so it prompt, prompts that action. Yes, I I, I agree. I like I like sort of raising the mass save question and and if we if we learn that 99 you know, of them have not had a mass save energy assessment well that tells us some useful information i think and then the third question if we were if we could do just three questions this would be a, a little matrix of box checking a second one yes or no or, and then the third who pays who pays the utility bills the oh, the the landlord or the tenant it's very that's a very key piece of information I'm, I'm sort of surprised that that sort of information wouldn't already be required in the permit. So I went online to look for the residential rental rental property permitting to see what was there. And when I click on the link to rental registration online permitting portal, I get a error 404, not found. <laughs> so do we even have? <laughs> it... <sighs> I, I'd love to see, it seems that it's an online application. So adding a few check boxes to the application seems like the obvious thing to do. Why do we have to bother inspectors with this? I don't understand that at all. It I don't know, be... let me talk to him again. I mean, okay. before, don't spin <laughs> okay. with this. Just right. focus on the questions, I think, and not like, you know, and then let me get those back to him and then see what he says. And meanwhile, so. someone should look into why the permitting link is apparently down. Yeah, that I, I mean, would, our, our whole system was down actually earlier today. So uh, it may be that they are fixing it up to represent the new bylaw, which just recently passed. Normally, the um, applications run, I think, through the end of June. And so in the past, the town has started promoting the to landlords to reapply 
in June. So it may be down for maintenance and updating un unless it's down because other systems were down for some other yeah, reason. Yeah, it's, it's down with an error 404, which means not found. So it's not, it's not the usual maintenance thing. That's that's something worse, it seems to me. Stephanie, um, is it would it be outside of our role to try to help with the formatting of these questions? Because I think trying to one of the things that you know in any type of survey there's all the survey bias and whatnot but you know making it as easy as possible for someone to just click the um the answers is that something we help with um i i don't think i mean i don't think you need to deal with the formatting of that no i i think i think however the application is online the town's going to deal with that i don't and to say we need a checklist and we just write what the checklist options are and people here can do that that's not anything they need help with it's not a matter of formatting it it was just a matter of implementing and i and i again i apologize i don't i wasn't sort of thinking about or, reporting out on this so much beyond just that he was asking for the reduced number of questions. Um, so I apologize again, um, exactly. I mean, I know he definitely said something about sort of tying it in with inspections, but um, I, I just don't, you know, as far as formatting that, you know, if it does get into the application and that's the way this gets in there, I don't think we need any more than just identify what it is you absolutely want. And if you can narrow it down, this would be great. And as far as having checklist options, we can do that. Can I throw something out there that maybe maybe folks would object to and maybe not? But it seems to, it seems to me that the biggest problem on here are the first three bullets. That's where all the energy is going. Domestic hot water is not as big a chunk of the energy bill for anyone, um, as heating generally is. Although in the summer, of course, it's it can be a it can be the major part. Um, yeah, it's often the second biggest energy user in a residence. Is it? Hmm. Okay. Okay. And if you have heating and cooling as the first one, hot water is often number two, and then refrigerator is often number three. Really interesting. Followed by lighting and plug loads. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, if and we... and hot water is often integrated into the heating. Yes, I know. Yeah. The system. So. Yeah. You yeah. gotta you gotta know what it is because you can't replace. Right. The system and then lose the hot water that went with it, for example. Yeah, but that's also a detail that can be worked out in the you know if you know somebody's using oil or you know somebody has a you know has a boiler and is using natural gas or oil or whatever they're using. Um, it, it's sort of a secondary thing. You go in and you see what exactly, how, how it's set up, right? How is it set up? What needs to be dealt with here? Um, but if you don't at least know what the heating is, I mean, I think, I think if I really were pushed to cut this down, I might rather than try to game it and stick six different questions in one, which gets a little confusing, the check boxes, I like the idea of the checklist, right? Um, maybe consider losing the hot water questions, maybe consider losing the questions about tenants paying their own energy bills. Um, because I suspect that's got to be, that information has to be out there somewhere anyway. It has to I, be. Um, I don't think it has to be. I don't know why it would be. Um, it would be buried in a lease agreement, but those are not necessarily made public. All right. So, yeah, I think we could assume that ninety percent or more are probably the tenants pay the utility bills, but that's just an assumption. The annual costs, I think, have to be dis. Well, that's when you sell a house, you certainly have to disclose it. Is the same true for renting? It, I don't believe you have to disclose that. You oftentimes yeah. a savvy buyer will ask that, um, but it's not a requirement. No. That is something that some communities have done, is they've made it a requirement that. Uh, the selling listing might have to include the annual energy costs. Some communities have done that, and that's a choice that we could pursue, but I don't believe that's in place here in Massachusetts. I think if you were to take off, I think if we're trying to streamline it, I would take off the age 
of the system. Yeah. Um, yeah. I it's... think we could, I, I feel like there's, if, if I had to have a blind spot. Okay. It would be, sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to think in that first question, not the the, the, the um, summary question, the, <laughs> uh, where we ask the age, the fuel age and type of heating systems. Um, the distribution part of that system is also important, yeah. um, be it hydronic or air. And I'm wondering if that can get into that <laughs> big question too. I mean, I think what it is is like you click electric and then it shows resistance or heat pump yeah. and you click one and then you click oil and it shows furnace or boiler and you yeah, click yeah. one. Yeah, that'd be good. You yeah. click gas, it shows furnace or boiler and you click one. Yeah. That seems like... That assumes that people don't do seems... furnace and boiler. <laughs> I don't think the application as it, at least as it's been in the past, has that sophistication. There's just a series of questions that get answered. There's no um, sort of different pathways depending on answers to, to the first question. Yeah. Yeah, I think other folks can probably figure out the details of how to ask, ask this stuff. The one that probably might be hard for, for the landlords or the property representative, the answer is the second to the last. What is the annual cost for electricity? Um, if the tenants are paying the bill, they may not have a clue. Right. Um, in fact, they you know even if they knew the baseline is going to vary from tenant to tenant. So that one, assuming it is these questions are on the permit application, that would be one that might be tough to answer um, from an owner's perspective. So maybe take that one off. Although the, what the renters really want to know. Well, I guess Stephanie, yeah, if you could find out kind of what the, the, I guess clarify that our thinking is that these would be on the online rental permit application, not something that an inspector would have to physically check. Although it, it could be both. But I think the main point was to ask the people filling out the rental permit application to provide this information. Right. But Actually, with that, Steve. Clarify yep. that, yeah, then get back to us um, and we see see what we what we can do. Well, and if if it's narrowed down to these three, um, that's helpful for me to say these are the, you know, these are the three. And, yes, and we'll also, we'll is, is does he feel that the application is the best place for them? You know, I, I want to ask him for some guidance, too. I mean, sure. you know, he may have an idea of cool. how we, you know, where would this, where would this information be? How would we have it so that it could be accessible? Because, I mean, if it's on the application, how will we retrieve it? Does it get on the property card? You know, I uh, think these are the things we want to ask him or I'll ask him. I mean, I'll follow up with him about this. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything more on that? If not, I think we are on to transportation. Uh, oh no, solar bylaw. Um, Steve, well, I guess I can speak to that because um, it's really in the middle of being uh, processed or reviewed by CRC. Okay. Um, and Chris Brestrup and I met with them last week, and we had the document divided out into what we felt was identified as various parts. Like there's the solar bylaw language, but then within it, there had been some regulatory language, some special condition language, also information that we thought was more relevant to a cover memo. So we actually separated out all of that language into separate documents. Um, they focused on review on just the solar bylaw language itself. Uh, no real discussions about what would be uh, about the language that's there, but just more 
is there more language from what we took out and made as identified as regulations? Is there some information there that they want to put back into the solar bylaw draft? So at least they were tasked with their homework for this next meeting was to identify what might be in the regulations they, that they want in the bylaw. And then Chris was looking at some um, making sure that there's no duplicative requirements. Uh, so for instance, like submittal requirements, making sure that it's, you know, in one place, not necessarily in two different places. So, you know, in the general bylaws and then in the solar bylaw itself. So she was looking into that. I was looking into information about the stormwater regulations and how, who's going to be the reviewing agency and how um, an applicant would have to comply with submitting a stormwater management plan. So I've been having some conversations about that. So the next meeting is on the 14th next week. And um, I think at that point, they'll try to pull together at least a draft of the by, of the bylaw itself. Again, not changing any of the language at this point, just based on what we've sort of gleaned from the original version separated it out and then put back in, if that all makes sense. Any further discussion? Oh, go ahead, Dwayne. I just um, put out there, if if I can be helpful in any way, let me know. Um, uh, it sounds like it's well out of our hands as the uh, um, task force, but um, if there's just anything you need to bounce off of me or the committee or the task force, whatever we call ourselves, a task force, um, let, let us know. Yep. Thanks, Duane. I At this point, I, I don't think so, because I think it's, you know, we haven't changed any of the language at all that any of you put forth. At this point, it's just trying to come up with what I think the CRC members feel more solidly is bylaw language that's consistent with our, our general bylaws. And I think... Um, like I said, they're going to review that. And after they have that basic draft, I think that's the draft that will go out to other committees and staff for review. So this will come to the ECAC. So it may be after next meeting, we could expect that you'll get a draft. I'm not, I can't guarantee it, but you know, it may be coming sooner than later for you all to review and comment on and staff will be asked to do the same. All right, good. So that should definitely be on agenda for next time then, just as a placeholder again, for sure. Most of these things stay on the agenda, I think. But that's something we might have a discussion over. So if there is a bylaw, you'll forward that to us, Stephanie, before the next meeting? Well, there is a um, it depends if they if they decide on the draft that there that is the draft, then yes. But I I don't I won't know until next week. They right. may have more discussion. Um and may not come to final conclusions quite yet. So we'll have to see after the next meeting. Okay. So next thing then, if there's no further discussion is transportation. Um, and I'm guessing this, Tony, go ahead. Do you have any updates? I, not at all. It's been a couple of weeks. Um, has the TAC been meeting lately? Stephanie? They had their last meeting was the the second to last week of April. And I was there for the first half of it, but they were focused on <clears throat> lighting, like street lighting, like getting street lighting. And then they were talking about the bike walk skate um, day. Okay. Or no, um, yeah. there was no discussion of in summer initiatives or anything. Yeah, I'm getting myself personally increasingly worried about the intersection at uh, Southeast Street and Pelham Road, Main Street, um, because I can no longer do it on my road on my road bike. I just I have to avoid it. And there's no place else to go. So it means getting in my car and taking my bike in my car somewhere because it's so dangerous because of all the patchwork there. I've just been almost killed one too many times that you can't ride on the side of the road. You have to ride in the middle of the road and even in the middle of the road, the pothole patching has made it virtually impassable unless you have fat tires. 
um, which I don't have on my road bike. So um, yeah, I it's bring uh, that up in their next meetings. Yeah, that intersection in particular, you know, th th when they patch, yeah, this is an ongoing problem. When they patch the roads, when they use that stupid pothole patcher, they don't take it all the way to the edge of the road. So they make the margin impassable by bikes every mm -hmm. time they patch another hole. So they've got to use it in a way that doesn't ruin the edge of the road. Um, and they're not doing that. <laughs> yeah. To bring yeah. Up. Bring up. I do know that um, has nothing to do with that. I will bring that up. I do know the last thing I forgot to mention is they are looking at um, increasing the number of bike paths um, okay. or bike lanes, I should say, yeah. um, in Amherst, um, specifically because of the students um, needing there, the... There, yeah, there are lots of other really simple things they could do. As soon as you leave Amherst, you see signs that say bicycles get four feet. You don't mm -hmm. see any of those in Amherst. And the only bicycle sign on Pelham Road is covered by a tree and has been for years. <laughs> so it's it's simple things like that would make a big difference. Anyway, well, I'll bring those up. Yep, thanks. <laughs> Other comments or concerns, questions? Okay, if not, then I have a few regional slash state things to mention that have come up. Um, Let's see, I had it in my, here it is. There are two things that are coming up that are of interest to us or should be. Um, one of them is the Mass Save. We mentioned this last week, I think Mass Save has a three year, the next three year plan for Mass Save, right? How is it gonna spend its money? How, what is What changes need to be made to the program? Um, I found a couple of, of uh, uh, things that need to be changed just by sitting out in my booth at the at the sustainability festival. Um, so I'm planning on trying to go to some of these, but th that three-year plan is now under review. Um, and there are documents to review and energy efficiency advisory councils, public comment listening sessions on May 13th and June 3rd. So I can send that email to Stephanie or to the group. How do you want me to do this, Stephanie? Either way, up to you. If you want to just forward it on to everyone, that's fine. Okay, I'll just forward that on. And it's just for your information if you want to go to one of these things. Um, but I think we should know about that. The other thing that I thought was interesting that uh, isn't, it's a Heat Smart Alliance thing that I'm going to, try to go to, again, it's a little crazy because it's this week. Um, the Heat Smart Alliance is hosting at their, at their monthly meeting, has a guest speaker, uh, Andrea Becerra. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. She's a sustainability director in Acton. And her talk is on Acton electrification, act on like get it, electrification from residential buildings to municipal buildings. And she's going to talk about what Acton has been doing to electrify the residential and municipal buildings. And I thought it might be interesting to hear in depth about what another town is doing. And I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Stephanie already knows what Acton is doing. Um, but uh, I, I just thought it was something that might be interesting to hear, especially their municipal. I'm mostly interested in if they're doing anything with municipal or uh, and um, uh, businesses. Now they don't mention that specifically, so that would be a question for them. They say residential and municipal. But it might be interesting to go to, and I will probably go, and if anyone else is interested, I don't know if this is only open to Heat Smart Alliance people or if anyone can go, but the notice came through Heat Smart Alliance. So those were the two things that I noticed. I'll try to have an update next time about, it looked like the last time I mentioned the, um, Joe Comerford's note about uh, input for the permitting of the Northfield, um, uh, what's it called? I can't remember the name of it. First Light, uh, Hydroelectric and Northfield Reservoir Pumping Stations. Um, that permit is coming up for review and for, uh, for um, renewal and they're going to be looking for public input on that too and I think it's important that we say something so about the importance of those projects um, 
So at any rate, that's also on my radar and I'll try to get more information about where to go for that next time too. All right, that's all I've got. Anyone else have any local or regional announcements? If not, Jesse has his hand up. Go ahead, Jesse. I don't know if, if this is the right place in the meeting, but um, I've been thinking. I was driving into work the other day, listening to fourteen hundred AM, which I highly recommend. In a very um, wonderful interview with our own Dwayne Breger was huh? um, <laughs> broadcast, <laughs> and it was a treat. And and I just want to. I had already been thinking to mention this radio station to all of us as a potential place where we might um, have these discussions. Maybe we find a way. I think they're interviewing a lot of people. If they're if they'll interview Dwayne, maybe they'll a few interview any of them. <laughs> anyway, it was it was great to just hear him talking about the issues about solar and and to I've been listening more and more to local radio, and I think it's it's got a lot of potential. So it's 1400 AM. I listen to it every morning, afternoon, and it's- uh, I think that was on, on electric vehicles, wasn't it? I was talking about- This one This one was about the results of your, ongoing results of your agrivoltaic studies. Oh, okay, okay. I did, uh, okay, that was by phone. Okay, I did another one in the studio um, in Northampton just a couple weeks ago on electric- I heard vehicles. that one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is something for us all to think about. Like, if we want to, if we want to have a voice, I, I think we decided. Listened. Yeah, I haven't listened to AM in years. What is fourteen hundred? Is... HMP. Sorry. W H M P. W H M P. I check it out in the morning. I, I, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of nice to be off of the national. Exactly. <laughs> Did newer cars still get the AM radio reception? <laughs> I don't think I've tuned in to AM for decades. Can you <laughs> listen online? The question is, can you listen online? Yeah, I, yeah, I started started using my eight tracks instead of uh, <laughs> AM radio. I, I remember when I first adopted my parents' uh, car, it only had AM. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I joke, but I think I do believe I remember reading that I think it was some electric car manufacturers were asking the FCC if they could not include AM radio in future cars. And they just they said there was no demand, but there was pushback because in many areas, that's the only stations you can get. It, the AM signal travels farther than FM signals. And they argue that in rural areas, people rely on the AM for weather and news and other important information. So I think that was the, there was enough pushback that the AM radio will be with us for a while, even if you can't figure out what button to press on your <laughs> modern radio to get to it. <laughs> At least I can that's funny that you think there's buttons in cars anymore. So. <laughs> well, you know, they're virtual buttons now. But... And if I don't have a long commute or if I don't drive my car to work, do I maybe just drive around the block and listen to the story? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, sorry. Okay. So, um, I think Laura's not here today, so we can skip the next agenda item unless anyone else has something to say about network geothermal or grants for that. Um, oh, there was the question last week of um, Applewood. I think Dwayne, were you gonna? No, okay. I, yeah, I, no, 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 I didn't do that yet. Yep. That somehow came up from that. All right, uh, so next is staff updates. So I already gave you the update on the RFP for the heat pump. So yeah. that's exciting. Um, mm -hmm. This is really a period of moving things forward. <laughs> so the heat pump RFP is out. And now I think I announced that our CCA was approved. Um, pretty sure I announced that at the last meeting. But yeah. um, we're having a meeting with our consultant next week. 
And so we'll be hearing about next steps, but the the timeline is probably that the program will launch sometime in September. Oh, nice. So it'll definitely be moving forward in September. So you'll be hearing a lot more about it over the summer because we'll be having to do a very vigorous um, public education campaign about it, yeah. which is actually required. So that's moving forward. Um, I did just get notification yesterday that we received uh, technical assistance. I think I had told you about becoming a um, community leader through the Mass DER program, the Green Communities program. Um, so we got some technical assistance to work with us on a couple of the requirements. Uh, we have four out of the six requirements already done. So um, this will help us with the one about the sort of transitioning the building to electrification, all of our buildings to electrification, the municipal building stock, I'll be specific. So um, we have, we, we're going to have um, some follow up. I don't know who our consultant is yet, but they'll probably be reach out soon. And I've already told the facilities manager. So we're planning on scheduling a meeting with them to work on that requirement. Um, what else? Um, I think those were kind of the big things. and. Valley Bike, I don't know if I was able to announce who the vendor was at the last meeting, but now I can tell you that it's Drop Mobility. Um, they, they're wonderful. I think they're going to be really great to work with. Um, they've been very responsive so far, and we anticipate that is going, you're going to start seeing bikes out, not specifically in Amherst, but in our regional network, probably as soon as, you know, within the next couple of weeks. Um, I don't know when we will get our stations back up and running, but I would anticipate certainly by sometime in July at the latest, um, we should have our, our stations back up and running again. So it won't be the full system. It's going to be just a, um, a fraction of the bikes. I think we have over 700 bikes and it'll probably be like half the capacity because we're using the bikes that have been in storage and uh, obviously they're not all going to be um, in condition good enough that they can be back on the road again. So um, they'll put out, they're just anticipating putting half of the system up and running this year. Next season, we'll have it completely up and running again. So those are my big updates. Yay. Nice. Very nice. Uh, ECAC member and updates. Any ECAC member updates? Go ahead, Dwayne. Yep, just since it came up from Martha, uh, uh, we are um, moving forward with our Solar Forum Part 2. It's a one-day, uh, pretty much full-day event um, scheduled for June 4th, Tuesday. Um, it, we will be getting a Save the Date announcement out um maybe this week or monday um with a um summary agenda uh we're still working we've sort of identified speakers we want to invite um but haven't done that yet don't haven't invited anybody yet mm -hmm. um i will say that um uh senator comerford and uh and rep dom have been partners uh in this uh with their help uh, we do anticipate that the two um, TUE chairs, uh, Telecommun Telecommunications Utilities Energy Committee, a joint committee, will uh, be there at the beginning. The purpose really for them to discuss um, the legislation that's on going um, uh, and, and will be worked on between uh, now and, and the uh, end of the session in end of July. Uh, pertaining to solar siting and, and particularly the siting commission um, report uh, recommendations that, that came out, uh, which will sort of set the stage for the uh, rest of the agenda in the in the forum. And we also anticipate having an official from EEA uh, Energy and Environmental Affairs to talk about the siting commission, their recommendations um, to set the context, and then and then we have a series of. Um, sessions uh in the second half of the morning and then two sessions in the afternoon some breakout a break we have one 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 the idea here is that we'll have 
you know, it, it's hard to have a conversation with a hundred some people, um, but um, we'll have uh, a bit more um, specific information about solar siting, the recommendations, permitting, it's uh, community engagement. These are recommendation pieces of, of parts of the recommendations that came out of the siting commission, uh, community benefit agreements um, discussed throughout the, um, the, the, the part, the forum. Uh, and then uh, we do have some breakout rooms where we hope um, to have those small enough so that um, participants can um, discuss these things um, in a facilitated way with each other. Uh, and then hopefully some activity at the end to sort of uh, hear from participants uh, either through a survey or some other uh, sort of working working exercise. So well, stay this is all that. on. And all, all on Zoom. Zoom. It's all Zoom. Yeah, it's all on yeah, Zoom. But all on June 4th. That, it's a one-day yeah, yeah, yeah. event at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So morning and good chunk of the afternoon? Yeah, till like 3.30 or so. Yeah. Good. The first part of that solar forum was amazing and enlightening, and I'm sure this one will be too. <laughs> so um, other announcements? Go ahead, Jesse. I, I, it's more of a question for the group, um, whether it makes sense for this group to uh, think about the climate impact of uh, the ongoing wars and make a statement about that, not getting into any of the politics or other associated issues, um, just simply a simple statement about the um, the climate impact and, and just to give a sense of where that is. Um, I think the first two months came in at a, about 280,000 metric tons of, of carbon equivalent um and which if you type that into your epa you know it's it's uh you know 650,000 barrels of oil or um what uh, you could i don't know how you want to quantify these things um but it's a lot and so i i don't know if if that's in our purview, but it, it seems simple enough. It's, it's, it would almost be an apolitical statement to simply say that a reason for ceasefire would include um, stopping the disproportionate un emissions caused by uh, the war. So I'll throw that out there as an idea. I don't know if we need to discuss it or maybe people want to think about it privately between now and next time. Um, just an idea. Yeah, I would be happy to sign such a note. Um, I wonder only um, about ECAC's role. Um, I think, you know, what, what, where would it go? We sign a letter to this effect. Is this something that we're going to send to local papers or? Um, I think I would be I would be fine with that. Um, more than fine, I think it's important. But I'm just wondering what what's the plan to so so. Let's say we have you draft something, Jesse, that we talk about and sign or not next time. Um, what happens then? I don't know. I I, I don't know. Because um, we could certainly send it to the local papers as a way of supporting a ceasefire, but that's also a... Yeah, or maybe it's 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 a piece of information to, to sort of support, you know, for anyone to use. I don't know. It's just bringing it to the front. It's, it's the... Assuming this group is limited in, in its politics, which is fine, but is it some, is it useful even? Like, is this, I, I don't, I don't know. What other folks think? I have my hand up, so I don't know if you can see, Lori. Um, I didn't see it. Sorry, I have the sun in. That's okay. No worries. Um, I was just going to suggest that maybe 
maybe it doesn't and and not that supporting a ceasefire is a bad thing because of course it's a very positive thing in my opinion but rather than framing it in in support of a ceasefire maybe it's just the climate impacts of war mm -hmm. and it's maybe just phrased that way and to me that is a perfect piece to write up and get into the gazette you know this is timely what are yeah. the climate impacts of war you know, we certainly know the human tolls, um, but, you know, maybe this is just like an additional lens and that you all could, you know, maybe you could write something up and that could go in the Gazette or the Bulletin, like you did the last, yeah. the piece that Stella, I think, had drafted. That seems reasonable to me. What other people think? Any... Any objections to doing something like that? Anyone uncomfortable with that? Go ahead, Steve. Were, were you thinking of a particular war or about the wars going on, the multiple wars going on in the world right now? I, I yeah, there's the <laughs> there's a the I mean, I was thinking about um, what's happening in Gaza and I know there's a lot happening at UMass. I, um, some of you made, I think Tony, I caught the end of that, might be more involved. At, I know people are more involved in different ways. It seemed, and there is and there is information being published, estimates are being published for the emissions of that um, campaign, which just makes it a little... It's it's there. I don't know if the same um, studies are being done for the other. I think there's twenty some odd active wars right now, um, worldwide, various sizes. So I, I'm not sure. It, it could be more general. I, I do think this is the one that is um, on people's. You know, people are engaging and it's just it seems like a relevant piece of information to add to that conversation how about jesse do you want to try drafting something for discussion next time sure yeah i'd be happy to um i i, I think it's i, I like i would like to think it would be short and concise and sort of adding to the discussion sort of like bring you know, it, it, it's not it's not controversial information. It's not opinion. It's just what it is. Right. Uh, Dwayne, go ahead. Yeah, I uh, would just do things real quickly. Honestly. I couldn't resist, but um, I'll share my screen real quickly. Uh, uh, if I can find it. Um, it reminded me of a poster I remember from my childhood we had in our basement <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> of, of this poster. So maybe uh, it, it comes around again, but this was from from the uh, other demonstrations we had about wars back a little bit after Vietnam. But, uh, but I remember that poster um, <laughs> from, from in my basement. Uh, but anyway, I'll stop that. But, um, uh, but then I was also thinking... Um, from you know climate scientists and modelers of, of climate change are often looking at uh issues of the of these um non-linearities in the climate system and the political and geopolitical system and um it does and i hadn't and i appreciate jesse you bringing this up. i never really dawned on me that the war itself has a um carbon footprint for sure um and not to mention all the concrete I'm not sure what's included in that, but the amount of concrete in Gaza that needs to be replaced now or in disposal, uh, it's, it's staggering, incredible. But anyhow, I was thinking, you know, there's there's this, and I don't know if we want to make a nuance, more nuanced pitch in this uh, um, short statement. I'd rather keep it short, but um, the fact that climate change is, is, uh, is, um, is and is expected to um, cause more strife and, and, potential war and violence 
uh, across our world um, it creates this uh, feedback loop uh, as well in in terms of uh, just um, more 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 climate change, more wars, more emissions from that. Um, so I just thought I'd bring that up as you know maybe something to mention in this little piece. Uh, I just I my only concern, which I, I'll just throw out there. I'm not sure if it's an overwhelming concern or or a critical concern, but is if we would be belittling. Uh, so, some of the other uh, first order, I would say, um, concerns and reasons to um, call for a ceasefire. We're we're certainly adding. We're not going to say that it's the reason, but and we're adding to it. But I don't want us to sound like we're belittling um, the, the the primary reasons to stop this. Conflict. Yeah, yeah, that's I think that's a really good point. I don't know how to. Yeah. I if I could, I just want to jump in again. I think my point was to not, you could certainly reference the war in Gaza as an example, but I wouldn't frame it as, I guess my point is just so that it kind of does move away from that, Dwayne. I would, I was suggesting you don't make it about us. You could use it as an example, but just talk about war maybe in general. Um, maybe there's statistics about some of the other conflicts that are happening right now as well, not just the war in Gaza, but just a piece about the climate, you know, the climate impacts of war. And Gaza could be, again, because it's current, an example, but I wouldn't frame it in the case for the ceasefire, because to Dwayne's point, I think that's what I was trying to allude to earlier, is that you, you don't want to sort of minimize the human toll like I was saying, we know what war is in terms of human life, but and we shouldn't don't need think another about, reason. Yeah. You know, it's just like, we shouldn't need another reason. That should be plenty. But just to say, like, there are, there are also these other impacts of war that, and actually these, these climate impacts also do continue to have an impact on the people that are left after war, right? Like, you know, what's the long-term consequences? And I think that positive feedback loop that was just mentioned. Um, so maybe, you know, that's, maybe that's kind of the framing of it, not just, I, I was, I was thinking maybe not focusing so much on Gaza, like using it as an example, but then maybe trying to find other statistics that support, you know, why war is just, bad for the planet. It's bad for people. We know that. It's bad for the planet. <laughs> and I think it can be written in a way that certainly does not minimize the, the you know, horrific loss of life and, and livelihood and you know, just the, the inhumanity of it doesn't need to be minimized to point out that there's yeah. also an effect on the climate, which ultimately impacts everybody and exacerbates conflict in the world. Yeah, in that in that database that you were referencing, Jesse, where you got that figure, is there? Do they have other data for like other World War II, how much that was, and or the Ukraine war for that matter? Um, or or Ukraine is a good one. Ukraine is a good one. Yeah, I, just, I can look. I just googled that the effects of Russia Ukraine war on greenhouse gas emissions and got quite a few reports and analyses on it. Um, that one was big as as Russia as as countries in Europe stopped buying Russian natural gas. That had a huge impact, including impacts here in North America uh, in terms of gas prices, electricity prices. So the impacts of that that particular war be, were huge, and and far fetched, uh, far reaching. Not not just in emissions, but also in the price of of, of fuels everywhere. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that makes me a little nervous about this. This is really not my area of expertise. It was, it, I'm, yeah, it, it seemed like this is the, uh, my only sort of public forum in life. And it's like, and so I thought, is this, does it make sense to, to make this connection? Um, it, I think it, it does. And, you know, we can, any numbers you can come up with, we can double check. Um, my partner writes for Manga Bay and they're often doing articles on on the effects of war on on the environment so um i would be willing to bet there's one somewhere recently um on that site so 
The other thing I would just throw out, if anyone has any stronger opinions that they they are welcome, I think I, I'm allowed to get an individual email from one person. Stephanie, is that right? Uh, no. Um, I don't know what you mean, Jesse, but if you're just looking for people to contribute some mm -hmm. thoughts, I think people can just contribute thoughts. It's just yeah. you don't. Uh, this isn't something that you're going to be doesn't have a direct impact on the work of the town. Right. So if someone maybe this isn't the place to if someone has a something they want to say, send me an email. Um, uh, I mean, I think you're going to draft it anyway. So if you draft it, I think it's going to be for discussion at the next meeting, probably. So people can contribute then as well. Okay. That sounds like the thing to do. So if you have ideas, send them to Jesse. Um, and Jesse, if you'll bring a, a draft or send it out in the packet beforehand so we can discuss it at the meeting. Okay, any other member updates? If not, we have for the Don, agenda. Oh, sorry. Don, Go ahead, Don. Sorry. Thanks, Lori. I, I, I'm moving from the profound, um, the effect of war on climate um, change to somewhat mundane. And I'm sure some of you have already seen this, but I had to renew my registration for my car. Um, and when I got the new registration, I got a... Um, a a, a puff a soliciting marketing piece from a company called Tetra that bills the easiest, most affordable way to update your heating and cooling system benefits of a heat pump with what is a heat pump and what the benefits are from the registry. So um, I, I was found it interesting. So. Yeah, I get those in the mail a lot, actually. Because they know somehow they but, know but they I have actually a, come, come from the red. I mean, that the state send this out, I think was fairly interesting. So good. That's good. They also they also know I have a gas boiler. So I'm not I'm not sure how they figured that one out. <laughs> I'm surprised it wasn't something about an EV <laughs> coming from the red. <laughs> um yeah, I, I think they part they they partner with Mass Save and such. They're trying to push incentives and people to upgrade their systems and get Mass Save involved too. That's about all I know about them. Good. 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 I had a question or thinking about so switching topics. Um you know, we're trying to figure out energy usage for rental properties and such. Um, is there a way or a path through the CCA of, of while we're setting the CCA up with the community to implement some sort of legislation process where rental properties are reporting energy metrics or anything like that or authorizing the CCA to, you know, use their utility data at all? I don't know about requiring that. Um, I think that's in terms of like being able to have access to the data, I think is potentially one of the benefits of having a CCA. So I can certainly, but I, I don't know specifically what metrics we get. So I can talk to our consultant. As I said, we have a meeting next week, so I can um, ask them about about that, about what data we have we would have access to when the CCA gets established. It, it would be, I mean, I'm not sure if it would in, be inclusive of heating data. Right. Yeah, just electricity. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because well, just because I know we talked about this a little bit, and Steve's brought this up about other municipalities having 
pathways legislation for private and public facilities reporting annually their energy, electricity, gas, steam, what have you. And the city basically taking that data and, um, and, and creating scorecards and such like that. So like just thinking about as, as we try to benchmark energy usage for, for buildings, both private and public, utilizing the CCA could be a really streamlined pathway for that. Um, and then I've started looking into how Eversource allows you to disclose energy information for building owners and such as well. And so I think, so I'm trying to figure out what's the best, how other cities do this. It looks like a lot of them use higher third parties to navigate and aggregate and collect all that data. But um, definitely something as we're trying to measure performance in the city over the next 20 years um, that I'm trying to think about here. Yeah, I don't know if the CCA is our pathway for that. I mean, I think things like, you know, the, the the work that Steve's been trying to do has been sort of trying to get to that. So yeah. I think, again, maybe through the rental registration, which we were so close, Steve was so close. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, getting that information on property cards is probably going to be like, you know, if if there's a way that we can make that happen, that's going to be one of the easiest ways to get the information available. I just don't know how we can ensure or require it. Like we don't have any, I mean, I think this is part of what Steve was sort of getting to and trying to get this information in the beginning was like, eventually, do we want to work towards getting some kind of building disclosure bylaw, you know? enacted so which is what you're saying michael you know you're both big you know it's yeah trying to yeah get to no, the exactly. same thing that steve's trying to do um yeah so, i mean that's kind of the basis of all municipalities is there's a bylaw in place yep. right instead of and it started out as voluntary but then it became a bylaw <laughs> yeah exactly and that's i mean i don't know that um i think there has to be because I sat in on some sessions with other communities uh, through NEEP um, on how communities were like trying to want to enact this kind of thing. And it's it's a challenge with getting landlords and property owners to be on board. So it would really require, I think, some real significant outreach to folks, uh, to these people, specifically the, the property owners and landlords to try to, you know, get folks either more on board with it, because the worst thing I think you want to do is, I don't know, well, I, I won't say that. I, I retract that last statement I said. Not the worst thing, but a challenging thing. You know, I think we want people, we want it to be an inclusive process. And I think they're already with the rental registration bylaw, there's some tension, frustration and tension within the town. So I think, you know, we want to try to work with people. So, but Michael, it sounds like you've been looking at what other towns are doing mm -hmm. and how they get this data. So if you have mm -hmm. insight there from that, that, that might be useful. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, most of it comes from create putting in the city putting legislation in okay and then setting up the program so that it's easy for yeah. building owners to do it and it's kind of hands-free for building owners so that's um, that's good to know too right? yeah. so you're trying to minimize the effort that building owners have to have right. to do right because they don't want to deal with it <laughs> you just but have to get the information Right. I wanted to one comment, though, about property cards, depending on exactly what that means, if it means just putting the data on the PDF document and then putting the PDF document up on the web, that might not be the best way to go, right? Because if you want to search for things, that's awfully hard way to do it, <laughs> one property at a time. You'd rather have a database somewhere with all this information in it, which is easier if you have a form, right? So the form hopefully won't only get used to make new property cards. <laughs> uh, hopefully it'll get used to make a database. 
Yeah, that, it's that mostly form again for... only get only gets updated every yeah. like it's not regular. It's depending Property on property cards have new transactions based on a database, but uh, are not not necessarily updated regularly. Right. That's... And they may be incorrect. And that was a totally different database than the rental registration permit right. database. Right. So that was one of the challenges that we had was trying to cross link the information from one to the other and that right. basically failed. Um, what we are trying to do by gather this information, that was just a preliminary step to get a better idea of what the energy use patterns are like in housing across Amherst. And we thought that the rental permit process might be able to get us that, you know, more than 50% of the properties in Amherst are rentals. So it's like, okay, if we can get it through that system, that might give us a pretty good insight on ages of systems and things like that. And then we would start considering these different options of carrots and sticks to help improve the energy efficiencies. Again, trying to favor the rental properties because there's that incentive, uh, lack of incentive um, by the property owners to improve the energy efficiency of those units. But yeah, we kind of got stuck at that very first step of ga data gathering. Right. Uh, but I still have on my list, Michael, to sort of make a summary of what I learned over our sort of years of, of when we had our, our um, group that was working on this that included a couple of us from ECAC and a couple of citizens. And then we also worked with um, oh, Coral, a Building Energy Advisory Group. Was that the, what was the organization, Stephanie, that Coral is coaching? It was the Rocky Mountain Institute's right, RMI. Um, BEA program. And they still, I still get the updates and emails and they, they have a wonderful sort of list of like, here's what this city or here's what this town or this state has been doing in terms of improving energy efficiency and buildings. And some efforts focus on the big buildings, the big commercial buildings. So Boston, Cambridge have um, very extensive rules for energy reporting of the big buildings. And then there are additional communities that focus on smaller buildings. Um, Brattleboro was one, um, Boulder, Colorado. And again, yeah, Portland. Yeah, there's a bunch of them and, and sort of different approaches, whether it's it's a disclosure or whether it's some sort of benchmarking and standards to uh, you know improve, to actually have some way of trying to improve the energy efficiency. Um, so, yeah, now, now my semester is winding down here. So in the next few weeks, I may be able to go through there and kind of summarize my notes. And I'll share that with you, Michael, and then we can sort through and maybe come up with some ideas for figuring out what to do in Amherst, what could work in Amherst. All right, great. With that, um, I think we've come to our agenda setting moment. Uh, I think we have a lot of this already. We've been sort of making note as we go on, we can probably talk about this topic again next week then uh, for sure. We'll stay on the um, agenda. And um, we just had, what was it, the um, uh, letter that Jesse's going to draft. And is there anything else that's not already on the? Tony was going to distribute a list of local right. climate action groups. Right, right. Maybe we can chat about that a little bit next week. Can brainstorm or, or yeah consider that right all right and with that i think it's time for public comment again and martha you can go ahead and unmute okay thank you thank you uh, first regarding the solar forum are any of the speakers actually physically going to come to UMass or are they all going to sit in their offices individually and not interact? Is there any way to get people to actually come so that they would literally have lunch together and talk to each other? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, I say that from my years of uh, attending science conferences and everything else, That's there's a real difference if you can get people together and boy, it sure would be great to have the TUE chairs come and actually have 
you folks taken? Look at an actual agrivoltaics array or look at some of the other sites in our area and say, well, gee, really, you know, if you're, what are the important things that have to go into a permit for siting or, you know, <laughs> but just having people be able to talk together is, is such an advantage. And that if there was any way for you to persuade some of the people to physically come here and see all the wonderful things in Amherst as well, <laughs> that would really be, be great if, if, if that was doable. I think it would really help the forum overall. So that's my I appreciate that. That's yeah, we're um that is not happening for several reasons. Um the cost of that, um the availability of people, the whole thing is virtual. Um uh, so, yeah, I we we did envision potentially a hybrid meeting when we were going through part one, but part two came together fairly quickly uh, because we wanted to get mm -hmm. this uh, pulled together before the legis or as the legislative session was in process. Um, and um, we, we don't, we, we don't have space uh, and we don't have budget um, for um, an in-person thing um, or, or the complications associated with um, uh, people coming to campus and hosting them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, okay. I, I appreciate your thoughts though, Martha on that. And yeah. okay. agree. Well, and I, well thank um, you. I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Thanks again, Martha. Appreciate always appreciate your input. Um, if there is no, is are you your hand up again, Martha? No, no. I was trying to lower it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> If there is nothing else, then I think we have reached the end of our agenda. And without objection, we will adjourn. See you all in two weeks. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.